Greetings again, subscribers. I finally had time to make finish part two of learning flight assist off guide. Um, apologies it's taken so long, there never seems to be enough time to play, let alone create a guide, and haven't been able to do either recently. For those of you who perhaps thought the first guide was a little patronising and nothing you hadn't really heard already on the whole, apologies, but I had to get the basics covered in the first place to cater for all levels of experience in players playing Elite. Hopefully no one will accuse me of not being thorough, that's for sure, which was the main reason for me starting, literally, from the start. So nothing is omitted. So thank you for humouring and sticking by me. Now in this guide we shall learn an array of specific activities and exercises to help you get to grips with actually flying with flight assist off, to learn a basic FA off skill set, and then we'll have a better understanding of what controls to input at all times and so be equipped to decide when to toggle between FA on and off and continue the ship's behaviour as seamlessly as possible. It is a very long guide. I couldn't really make it any shorter, otherwise critical techniques would have been missing, and because all are fundamentally related to each other, really needed to be in a single guide. Plus I've gone into specific detail depending on your control method, whether you have digital thruster controls or analog, because I appreciate players will have both and because of this the techniques will be slightly different. These particular variations in control method required quite a bit more detailed explanations to help with. I appreciate time's money and you might not want to watch it all at one time so it is split up into many parts again so you can always come back to it a few times if not many. I hope this makes up for its delay in actual posting. Before we start, a few things to say, explain first. I've split up each lesson separately to give you one or two things to concentrate on at each time. I've tried to come up with specific activities in using what we have at our disposal in the game to try and break it down into manageable segments for the most crucial aspects of piloting with no flight assist. I had to think of particular practical exercises that I feel will aid you and benefit you to learning more quickly and then hopefully we can bring them all together because we have learned what to do in a certain particular circumstance or scenario. You should then know what to do for which, if, when it arises. As much as at first you might think some are quite easy, perhaps even boring, I would still recommend you practice them, start making what is best described as control input duration habits, which is ultimately the key to successful flight, how long you hold each joystick axis and each thruster. Each lesson will get progressively harder for each consecutive subsequent exercise. Feel free to skip over any initial ones if you really do think, oh that's easy, but only then. Yes, I trust you know the stage you're at yourself in your own skill set. But again, this whole tutorial is a guide for everyone's level of experience. The exercises at the end are actually quite fun, and then with all lessons accumulating into one final fundamental manoeuvre that could be considered one of the most useful redirection strategies. You will have seen myself and Isinona using it often, something I'll refer to as this fundamental redirection maneuver strategy. Elite Dangerous doesn't have a velocity vector HUD in the conventional sense. One thing it lacks is accurate velocity numbers for all three ships' axes of momentum. All the speed indicator is telling us is the current velocity towards our current vector, whether this current vector is forwards, backwards, laterally or vertically, depending on our current ship orientation. What it doesn't tell us is velocity values for all three directions of axis at the same time, if you remember the six degrees of freedom three axis in the previous guide, x, y and z. Ultimately, this doesn't really matter. It is simply why, in my opinion, it is hard to learn to pilot with no assists, particularly since the dust has been scaled back as well and is subsequently why it is quite hard to know how much of each thruster for each of these three ship axes we need to apply, and is also why perhaps things go badly for you, particularly in combat, when you're having to input specific controls for specific ship behaviour shadowing a target, not just when you feel like it when simply practising alone. I've heard many a comment that said, I'm fine flying around just on my own, but as soon as I'm in combat it all goes awry. I would suggest there are primarily two reasons for this, other than the obvious you want to relax whilst in combat. You are concentrating too much on the target itself, so getting distracted from your primary task continuing to watch the space dust and throttle display, and the very fact you can't simply follow a course you've laid out yourself when simply practicing alone, because you're obviously having to track and shadow a target position. 
Anyway, like I say, without a conventional vector HUD for easy, quick reference, we can only go on the angle and speed the space dust is streaking across our field of view, which after a bit of practice and experience with it is enough. It's perhaps not quite enough information for the novice to learn quickly. So, if I point you towards the key cues we have, but particularly the best locations in the game to learn to fly, and in these certain areas where there is more on-screen information to aid us in learning initially. For instance, a fixed point in space at relatively close proximity and space dust at the same time. And that isn't an asteroid field with many objects to crash and burn into. So as much as I'll try not to mention it anymore, you will need to be making a conscious effort of looking at the space dust. For all these exercises to come, because there are of course an infinite number of variations of ship orientation possibilities, which in turn will then require a similar infinite amount of varying thruster control inputs, we of course can't cover anywhere near all of them. However, most of these exercises I've made are under the premise. Your first task in any battle confrontation, you are primarily going to roll your ship's orientation so your target flies over your head, to use pitching manoeuvres as preference because you're the slowest axis on all ships in which case these following lessons are mainly under the presumption you have made this fundamental ship orientation first and so will subsequently need to learn the specific ship thruster controls in these lessons to come as your basic skill set. Like I said we'll bring all what we've learned together for this fundamental redirection maneuver as the last exercise. There is one exception namely the lateral thruster exercise which I've added because it also could be considered a fundamental technique you will need for strafing a target as a backup plan when you haven't perhaps had time to orientate with roll to position your hostile over your head in a vertical strafe. Huge tip, fact, I can give you right now before we start. The thruster I use more than any other during combat I expect 70 to 80 percent of the time is vertical up thruster, thrust upwards because of this roll until the target is above me premise. Someone can use the canopy, then pitch up with thrust upheld to follow your hostile. All other thrusters are of course still used, but nowhere near as much. So, however you have your control mapping set, vertical thrust up is the one you will be using most of the time during combat, believe it or not. Obviously not during normal space flight, but definitely during combat. So you'll need this thrust up map somewhere where it can be held for sustained periods without your hand finger getting tired. Uh, right, I've said what's needed to be said. Let's get on with it. So, first exercise. Something simple to start off with. For this particular exercise, we need a planet. So we have a fixed point in space and can notice the space dust clearly. We'll not need the dust in this first exercise, but in a minute we will need it for the next exercise. A planet is best for this as a reference point. Uh, even a station at distance would do but we're going to work on quick ship orientation and countering the rotation so we can head off in an intended direction with flight assist off obviously. In all these exercises to come make sure you are not moving at all by engaging flight assist to stop any momentum then switch it back off when you are ready to start the exercise. This particular exercise will help you to gauge how much of each joystick axis is required and is needed to start and stop your ship's rotation. So we'll start with roll, start the ship rotating on its own axis and then try and stop it when the planet is at a certain point, not just when you feel like it. To have a goal will enable you to see how well you're doing and how effective and successful your inputs have been. In the real world of combat this exercise is particularly useful for this main premise scenario, rolling until your target is above you, so you can then pitch up, turn and follow. Start with the planet at bottom of your field of view and start a rotation of 180 degrees to stop when the planet is exactly at top of your view. Keep practicing till you get pretty good at this if you aren't already. Yaw is very slow so we'll skip this. It's not the ideal axis for quick maneuvers anyway. It's just a useful axis to line up your shot. But pitch, of course, very critical to get this down to a T. So this time, line up the planet in your radar as if it were a contact behind you, i.e. a hostile that has gone whizzing by you. There are two exercises with pitch I suggest you practice, one without boost and then one with boost. This exercise without boost is quite simple, similar to the roll one, but practice getting this down to a T first before moving on by stopping the ship pitching with the planet at the centre of your view. Again, keep practicing until you get proficient at this stopping it when you need to, not just when you decide to. Again, it's very useful to have a goal. Now the one with boost. 
by trial and error depending on the ship you are in and the speed you are travelling you will press boost mid pitch and use the initial part of the boost cycle to increase the remaining pitch manoeuvre accelerate your pitch rate and shoot off towards a planet or in the real world your intended target again a planet or any fixed point in space will be useful as a goal to see how well you're doing you'll notice after the initial press of boost there is a slight delay before the boost cycle actually starts whilst it's charging up so practice to see at which point during your 180 degree pitch you need to trigger the boost initially to then shoot off in the general direction of the planet it'll be somewhere around 90 degrees of your 180 degree pitch so about halfway but like I say this will vary depending on your current velocity of your ship which in turn means the maximum rate at which you can turn this exercise is more to do with consecutive control and inputs not necessarily timing we'll get to the actual timings later I just want you to practice what it feels like with zero vector momentum first. This control sequence we'll learn here will need for later for something I would consider the fundamental FA off redirection maneuver. You will have seen myself and Isanona using it often. When quickly reorientating against a hostile that's gone shooting past you and you want to follow. You will however need to add thrust up at one point in this. Nothing else, just thrust up. Because without thrust up held during the part of the boost cycle when it actually kicks in, the trajectory result specifically will be slightly skewed otherwise, and this trajectory will be below our intended trajectory towards the target, because otherwise the boost will be sent through the default forwards thrust as opposed to the direction we want thrust up, the one we need so our trajectory is sent upwards towards our target above us. So just add thrust up just before the boost kicks in, after its initial spool up charging, and after a bit of practice and timing you should have orientated 180 degrees very quickly and shot off towards your target. But again there are a few things that vary this timing that we'll discuss in more detail later on. I'd just like you to practice with the maximum pitch rate speed first, because we are sat still, with the quickest duration of consecutive control inputs required. If you can get this down to a T now, the slower control sequence later on, when we have vector velocity, will be much easier, almost in slow motion compared. These next few are initial lessons for controlling ship momentum, with this one learning with two opposing thrusters, one for momentum and one to counter this momentum, and is also for fine joystick control. You will be facing at 90 degrees to your current vector, so travelling laterally on one axis, and applying small joystick control inputs to keep the ship's orientation at, or as close to, 90 degrees as possible. In the real world of combat, you are strafing a target and want to stay at a particular distance from your target while strafing. We'll be using the space dust, obviously, and the throttle speedo display and the station itself as reference as we travel down its axis. But try not to concentrate on the station too much, more the space dust. The station is just there for a reference to target, but mainly just as a guide to gauge our success, using it as a parallel to our vector. To make this work as effectively as possible, we need to align as close to, or as near to, 90 degrees to the station's axis in the first place. We can use the station's lights at its entrance end to line ourselves up, which will give us a starting reference point to see how effective and successful our control inputs have been once we get to the other end. These Orbis type stations are the best for all these next exercises, particularly the Orbis type stations with the habitable ring at the far end. We have a useful reference point at both ends to gauge how successful we've been, plus has the benefit of saving time as you can turn around at one end and do the same coming back by aligning with the habitable ring. So align yourself with these aviation warning lights so you are as close to 90 degrees to the station's axis. It helps to check you have your ship's roll lined up as well. Using your hardpoint's target reticule will help with this. In this case, using your along the station's axis to see how in line your roll orientation is aligned. One doesn't have to get completely fussy about this, it's just for a guide. But the closer you align, the better the results will be to see how well you've done and you won't crash into anything at the other end. Make sure you are at least six kilometers from the station too. The controls I'll be using in this will be lateral thrusters and the odd little application of joystick orientation to keep a line down the station's axis, but mainly using yaw as we travel laterally in parallel with the station's axis, primarily to check your precise orientation so you are as close to 90 degrees to your current vector as possible. 
If you don't touch the joystick, you shouldn't drift offline, but it's good practice to check your ship's orientation anyway as you fly along the station's axis, so applying small inputs of joystick to keep the ship's orientation facing the station, so pitch and yaw will be needed for this as well in small measure, and it's all good practice for aiming. Uh, remember to anchor your elbow when aiming. What we don't want is any unintended roll input, because it would dramatically alter our vector when travelling laterally. As we travel along the station's axis, we will be speeding up and slowing down to the bottom of the blue zone, even beyond, all with flight assist off. Start your initial momentum, however, with assist on, so your trajectory is accurate, and our vector is as close to parallel to the station's axis as possible to start with, and then turn assist off after about a second. This exercise is primarily about learning habits for holding each thruster and counter thruster but fundamentally enable you to gauge how long you have to hold the correct counter thruster to counter the ship's momentum. So in the real world again, we'll know how much or how long of a counter input with this relevant counter thruster is needed to slow your ship down. If you can get into habits of looking at your speed and seeing how long you have to hold these counter thrusters for, the more you do this will aid your subconscious to start doing these things naturally and without having to think about them too much. It might be a tad boring at first, but the more you do this, the more it will become second nature. Sometimes, if I've switched ship, I do this briefly to gauge the difference to get my eye back in quicker. As I said in the previous guide, part one, and I should perhaps remind you of this because it's quite critical to remember, simply because it's the opposite technique of flying with assist off. Most, if not all, of our most important control inputs when piloting with flight assist off are counters trying to keep the ship's momentum, speed, under control and in a manageable area. With flight assist off, you'll certainly not be having any issues speeding up and increasing velocity. So by watching the direction the space dust is streaking across our field of view, we apply the same direction thruster, or thrusters in later exercises, to bring the ship under control down to a more manageable speed. So, like I say, all I'm using in this exercise is lateral thrusters and perhaps the odd little joystick inputs to keep me facing the station's axis as close as possible because it's parallel with our vector. You'll notice as you yaw left and right, or even tiny inputs of forwards and backwards thrust, the ship's speedo displays whether you are travelling slightly backwards or slightly forwards. Try and keep the ship's orientation as close to 90 degrees as possible by periodically turning with yaw and or little inputs of forwards backward thrust, but yours better to leave our vector unchanged. But by noticing the speedo change its direction means you are close to 90 degrees to your vector, and when you think you are really close to 90 degrees, apply your lateral thruster inputs to speed up and slow down, all the while looking at the speedo and the space dust. Sorry, I'm drilling it in, aren't I? Good. Watch the space dust. Same exercise again, but practice toggling, switching flight assist on and off as you travel down the axis, and this time try and keep the velocity as static as possible. This is a bit more tricky, you'll notice the differences between the two modes. As soon as switching to flight assist off, you will have to release the thruster immediately after to halt any acceleration. Then when switching flight assist back on, you will have to immediately apply a certain amount of thruster input to keep the speed going. All good practice for toggling between the two modes. If you have an analogue lateral and or vertical thruster controls for this, uh, we'll be doing a vertical thruster exercise in a minute, but with digital controls you can still do this, but you'll see for consistent velocities with flight assist on, with digital controls it's quite hard. So this exercise will show how useful any analogue control really is for fine ship movement, whether you're piloting with assist on or off. It will also show you if you do only have digital thruster inputs, all the more reason to use flight assist off for these strafing circumstances, as quick digital thruster inputs won't have much effect on your velocity when piloting with no flight assist.
Now we'll do the same exercise as the lateral thruster one, but with vertical thrusters instead. This one will be a lot more useful in the real world, because this is part of the preferred manoeuvre that you will be using primarily in combat. Because in combat you will roll until your target is above you, the original premise because of the yaw, the slowest axis on all ships. So should use the pitching manoeuvre as preference. So as well as the obvious strafing a target and keeping its distance consistent from you, this particular exercise will also help you with a segment of this roll and then pitching manoeuvre. This exercise is at the midpoint of this manoeuvre, before we pitch up to follow our target just after we've just passed each other. If you can imagine a target that's gone whizzing over your head, you have then pitched up 90 degrees to this point that we are at in this exercise, and then continue to pitch up with thrust up, held, and even a boost as well to latch onto your target's tail. Remember the orientation lesson at the start of this guide with pitching and boost. So, this exercise here is exactly the same as the lateral thruster one, but again with little joystick inputs to keep the ship from drifting off from 90 degrees to the station's axis. And again, all I'm using is vertical thrusters to increase and decrease my speed, countering this momentum with the opposite vertical thruster, and small inputs of joystick for orientation to stay as close to 90 degrees to the station's axis, all with flight assist off. Notice pitch now changes the speedo, displaying whether you are travelling slightly forwards or backwards. And of course thrusting forwards and backwards has a similar effect, but this will change our vector, which we don't necessarily want too much of in this exercise, so use pitch instead. Practice alternating with pitch inputs to see how it affects the speedo display, and apply your thruster inputs when you feel you are as close to 90 degrees to your vector as possible. Again, the more you do this, we'll start to ingrain subconscious habits for how long you have to hold each counter thruster to slow down to a specific speed, usually the blue zone. So you are then set at the best manoeuvral speed for following manoeuvres. Watching the speedo throttle display itself is particularly useful when piloting with no assist, so getting into habits again of keeping an eye on it is all good practice. It is, of course, the most accurate display for at least one of our three shipped axes, the main vector axis. Ideally, we need two more throttle axis displays for these axes at 90 degrees to our vector, but the space dust will serve as a substitute for these remaining two that are missing. The same vertical thruster exercise, but with toggling, switching between flight assist on and off again as you travel down the station's axis, plus using small inputs of pitch to keep the ship from travelling too much forwards or backwards when you add your vertical thruster inputs. Remember to keep an eye on your speedo display changing again as alternating thrusters engage and get ready. In all these exercises, check by adding a small amount of pitch, in this case, not your like the previous lateral thruster one, so pitch to check if you are as close to 90 degrees as possible, and the speedo should display and switch between travelling forwards and backwards quickly if you are close to 90 degrees, which is when to add your thruster inputs to stay as in line with our original vector as possible. Again, all I'm using in this is vertical thrusters with a few small inputs of joystick for orientation if needed to stay targeted as close to 90 degrees to the station's axis as possible. Obviously, we wouldn't be replicating these exercises exactly in combat, but practicing each of these exercises separately will enable you to learn what to do for a certain specific scenario, and get our brains remembering these control input durations, and then we'll be able to combine them all together in a seamless whole manoeuvre. As mentioned, I'm trying to separate specific exercises for you to practice individually that require certain control inputs for each, not all inputs at one time and then you can hopefully bring each and all of these exercises together for these seamless whole manoeuvres.
So, next exercise is to add an additional separate axis, so two in total. Slightly harder because the amounts of each will vary depending on your current orientation. The best way to practice these is to actually bring the ship to a halt, or at least anything down to around 20 or 30 meters per second. And then for starters you'll stay online-ish with our original vector and our station reference and remain at a rough distance in parallel and we'll be able to gauge more successfully how effective you've been at applying the correct amount of each thruster. As I say, we wouldn't necessarily be replicating these exercises exactly in combat, although sometimes you may, but certainly not to a stop. We'll be doing it somewhere into the velocity blue zone, but to reduce your momentum all the way down to as slow as possible will enable you to learn this more quickly because you're not having to reset and line up at the start each time. A keynote to remember. In the real world of combat, you will probably be adding full forwards thrust for the most part with all these strafing manoeuvres, unless your intention is to try and remain at a consistent distance from your hostile. But otherwise, you have probably just turned from dueling with a hostile and are subsequently in a strafing manoeuvre at this point that we are at in this exercise. So I've begun a strafe and then need to start travelling back towards your target, which is where you would add this full forward thrust together with whichever other thruster you've been applying to bring your main vector momentum under control, in this case vertical thrust. So adding full forward thrust as the default input along with vertical thrust is the real world application. But slowing to a stop whilst keeping in line with our station reference will enable you to learn the other thruster inputs that aren't forward thrust much quicker. So for now, slow to a stop, or at least down to a very slow speed. Speed up and back down again, and then later we'll add the full forwards thrust in a separate exercise. Try this at a few varying angles of pitch to see the differences in thruster input amounts or durations. Again, the more you do this, the better. So all I'm using in this is vertical thrusters and forwards backward thrust in varying amounts depending on my angle to my vector. No lateral thrusters are needed in this exercise. To toggle flight assist with two ship axes of momentum is harder again. I suggest you at least try to keep the ship's momentum as consistent as possible by adding the two relevant thrusters when switching assist back on and then releasing them as soon as you disengage flight assist back off. We are never going to be able to stay at a consistent vector doing this, but trying to keep as close to parallel to the station, i.e. our vector, will indicate how far off our original vector we become. As a practical exercise, we are going on the angle the space dust is streaking across our field of view and generally guessing a rough amount of the two relevant thrusters. This is perhaps one of the hardest parts of toggling between assist on and off without a conventional vector hood. It's very hard to gauge how much of each thruster to apply and subsequently continue the ship's behaviour seamlessly. However, this exercise with these particular orientations demonstrated is again part of the manoeuvre when orientated for the original premise, roll and then pitching manoeuvre, and so is subsequently the only time you'll perhaps need to do it. When switching between assist on and off, you should at the very least add the main vector thruster when assist is on and counter thruster when assist is off. The thrusters to continue or counter most of your ship's momentum by picking this main vector direction, in this case vertical thrusters. You will at least keep the ship moving as much as possible and not induce much stalling of consequence. As you'll see in a minute, when we try three ship axes of momentum, we are not even going to attempt to toggle between FA on and off. To add the relevant amounts of each of the three thrusters and then counter thrusters for each of the three ship axes is very hard to do effectively. But like I say, if you at the very least add this main vector thruster, so with these currently orientated positions demonstrated here, I have added it as a lesson because it's the most useful real-world scenario, and the only time you'll really be needing to do this. With the varying pitching angles that the ship is orientated in this exercise, the thrusters needed are primarily vertical thrusters and secondly forward-backwards thrusters. 
so as to continue our momentum and counter this momentum as seamlessly as possible. The forwards-backwards thrusters are needed in small measure, primarily I'm using vertical thrusters, so it is possible of sorts. If you can achieve this, then all the better, but like I say, these current orientations are demonstrated for a lesson because of its real-world application, and is the only time you'll really need to learn this. All other ship orientations don't really have a real-world application, so are a bit pointless to learn anyway because of our original roll until target is above us premise. These varying pitching orientations is the only time you'll really be needing this technique for the real world of combat. Plus remember, the forwards-backwards thrust in this will be replaced with a full forward thrust as a general rule of thumb for the real world application anyway, because you'll probably be wanting to push your momentum back towards your target. I've simply added the forward thrust in this in small measure together with my thrust up so you can learn the effect this has to bring the ship under control as quickly as possible, whether you have two or even all three axes of momentum, and is an incredibly useful skill to learn. It's surprising the difference it makes in how more quickly you can bring the ship under control in countering this secondary lesser ship momentum axis as well as the primary vector axis instead of just countering the primary vector axis on its own. It really does make a difference to counter at least the two highest ship's momentum axes, which in turn means for three axes of momentum you will need to counter at least two, hence the importance of learning at the very least this exercise and getting quite proficient at it. So, this time we are going to add all three ship's momentum axes together, so quite a bit harder again, but suggest you get quite proficient at the first two exercises, practicing just one, but particularly the two ship axes of momentum before attempting this one. We will orientate the ship at 90 degrees down the station's axis as before, but once up to speed we will orientate slightly skewed, so not exactly at 90 degrees to any of your three ship momentum axes. So with a little of lateral and vertical momentum to our current vector added intentionally, and by gauging the current direction of the space dust across our field of view, we will know which thrusters to apply to bring our ship under control. This exercise is key really to successful piloting with no flight assist, because most of flying around with flight assist off, you won't be exactly at 90 degrees to any of your momentum axes, probably nowhere near. Again, remember the fact, most are important inputs when piloting with no flight assist are counters to bring the ship under control. Which means, remember the demonstration in part 1, about a simple way to remember which thruster you need to apply to bring the ship under control. Whichever direction the space dust is streaking across our field of view, so in this case it is streaking primarily in the upwards direction, it's travelling away from us because we are travelling backwards as well, so the dust itself is travelling forwards across our field of view, and it's travelling slightly right also, because we have a little lateral momentum also. So up, forwards and right. We need to match this with the same thruster inputs to bring the ship under control. By noticing this rough angle of the dust, we can guess a rough amount of each thruster to apply to realign our vector. But remember, like the two axes exercise, they'll invariably not be in equal measure. So you'll need to practice how much of each, or I should say as well, how long of each. If you have analogue thruster inputs like I have, it's simply a case of applying the three relevant count thrusters in varied amounts, so much easier than if you only have digital thruster inputs. However, this is not the end of the world if you have only digital controls. You're just going to have to add full thruster amounts and release them at varying times once you've scrubbed off each of the three momentum axes. You're simply going to have to time the durations of each thruster by noticing when the space dust is in line. By inline, I would suggest initialize the main vector counter thruster first, this is a given, but then concentrate on removing any lateral movement, so at the very least you are travelling back to only two axes of momentum whilst your ship is slowing down trying to counter this main vector momentum. If we were to refer to this exercise specifically because of the infinite variations, but in this exercise, which is the most common manoeuvre, falling downwards primarily, so vertical up is needed primarily to count this, so you can definitely apply this straight away. Then while simultaneously holding forwards thrust, which is what you would normally be doing again to head off towards your target, 
I suggest you try and get the space thrust travelling as close to vertical as possible first by adding the lateral thruster counter so you've removed any lateral movement, leaving just your vertical up thruster and forward thrust held all this while and released last to bring the ship under control as quickly as possible and head off back towards the hostile. Forgive me if I've made it sound more complicated than it is, because it really isn't, so please bear with me. With digital controls, at most, you've only ever got to apply three thrusters at one time, obviously, but not necessarily all three in equal measure, so subsequently for the same duration. So firstly, concentrate on this main vector thruster counter, first and foremost, and start to hold this, so vertical up, in this exercise. Then the next logical step would be to start removing the second most momentum axis, in this scenario forward thrust, before adding and removing the ship axis with the least momentum. However, considering we would normally be applying this full forward thrust in the wheel world of combat, to start to head back towards our target, I would suggest concentrating on removing any lateral movement as your secondary priority. So main vector counter thruster first and foremost, thrust up, then remove any lateral movement lateral thruster together with applying full forward thrust. Again, if we are using the same premise as described at the start to roll until your target is above you, which we are in these vertical thruster exercises, we will be closely orientated to this position we are at here in this exercise. So by noticing the three directions of the space dust, match this with the three relevant counter thrusters, initialize them all together. Release the least momentum axis first, usually lateral movement. Then once the space dust is travelling away from you and vertically, then you can release any lateral thruster input. And then the second and third axes with the dust travelling away and vertically in your field of view, so forwards thruster and then vertical up thruster, will be released last. But like I say, we'll probably be adding full forwards thrust as default, so don't necessarily need to concentrate on this particular axis. So primarily countering this main vector axis, vertical thrust, and removing any lateral momentum with lateral thrusters until the space dust is travelling vertically up our field of view. Adding all three simultaneously with varying amounts of analogue controls is the ultimate method of bringing a falling ship under control as quickly as possible with flight assist off. With digital controls, it is still possible with this method just described. You are simply at a disadvantage. Another reason I actually prefer my gamepad because of its analogue characteristics over my Rhino hands-on throttle. I wouldn't go back to it even if I could. Of course, activating assist on for a brief period does all this for you, so it's still a valid technique, you just won't be learning anything. So, like I say, I will not toggle flight assist back on at all in this one. To switch between the assist computer and flight assist off with all three axes of momentum is quite hard. To apply the exact amount of each thruster at each toggle transition will be very tricky for a novice, even with analog controls. At most, you should do what we did for the two axes of momentum. Apply at least the two highest momentum axes of the three axes to continue the ship's behaviour as much as possible. So refer back to the two axes toggling lesson for this. But to reiterate, the key points to remember for this scenario in this exercise are to counter the primary vector axis and initialize this counter thruster first and foremost, vertical up thruster. Then whilst holding your full forwards thrust to head off towards your target again, remove any lateral movement with lateral thrusters, which will aid this primary vector counter thruster thrust up to do most of the work, because it's all that is needed to go with our full forwards thrust. And you'll be bringing the ship back under control, but with a vector straight ahead again and heading off back towards your hostile, pretty much as quick as the assist computer would. But instead, as the actual exercise, so we can actually learn this as quickly as possible, we'll leave the full forwards thrust aside for the time being. Try and bring the ship to a stop to see how effective your three inputs have been. In the actual real world of Leap, it would only need to be down into the blue zone of combat, which is also this exercise's real world application in the rare occasions when we don't want full forward thrust, so are intentionally trying to stay at a consistent distance from your target. So, as much as you wouldn't be doing this to a stop in combat, I suggest you counter all the way to a stop to see how effective and successful you have been applying the correct amount of each of the three thrusters. Again, one doesn't have to be completely accurate and successful. If you can get the vector velocity down to 20 or 30 meters per second, you're doing well. Anything beyond this is next to impossible anyway because the space dust is invisible anymore. Also, with digital controls, you won't be able to stay as in line with parallel to our station reference, so don't be so concerned with this if you have digital thruster controls. Try this many times with varying angles of orientation to practice how much or 
how long of each thruster, depending on your controls, is needed to bring the ship close to a complete stop. If you can bring it to a stop successfully, for when you are in combat in the real world again, when all you need to get down to is the blue zone, simply because you have been trying to bring the ship to a complete stop, what you learn here will be all the more beneficial because you'll know what you've inputted is effective, because you have learned the correct control inputs and habits successfully by bringing the ship to a stop. One last exercise before we bring all these lessons together for what I consider this fundamental redirection manoeuvre. So yeah, before that, one more really useful exercise. This one is quite enjoyable actually, I enjoyed doing this when I was learning, it was a lot of fun. What's particularly good about it in a learning capacity is we have a fixed point in space, the rotating station, uh, fixed on one axis anyway, and even once you get very close the space dust is still showing and is still visible, so it's a very useful learning tool. As I'm sure you've realised, normally the space dust disappears once you get at a certain distance to a station because we don't need it anymore, because we have the station as the fixed point in space. But like I say, in this scenario, using the spiralling habitable ring, the space dust is still visible no matter how close you get, so incredibly useful to see how our thruster inputs affect the space dust at speed, together with something to aim for that's solid. Again, I suggest you concentrate on the space dust as much as possible. It will eventually become second nature, but yes, I've said it again, and even if you're thinking, God, he would shut up all the blooming space dust, in which case means I've done my job and succeeded in getting you to think about it. I suggest you set engine pips to max, and you try this firstly with fight assist on, and you'll actually see how restrictive assist on can be in certain scenarios. To continue around the habitable ring or a real world manoeuvre in the real world of lead to a consistent turn of a certain circumference, one actually hits a threshold that no amount of any more yaw or pitch input can tolerate. You'll see that you'll reach a certain velocity whilst turning to keep the turn the same radius or circumference and won't be able to travel any faster, similar in principle to the first guide's assist off's advantage in the turn rate contest demonstration. So, with flight assist off, one can make the same turn but at a much faster velocity. So it really shows one of the disadvantages of assist on and benefit of assist off, clearly. I found this activity akin to oversteer drifting in a consistent power slide. I'm fortunate to have an Audi Quattro here at home and a fair bit of snow this time of year. And this exercise reminds me of the fun I have on my local country roads in the snow. This exercise is very similar because it's all about throttle control with very little actual steering. Whether you have a four-wheel drive toy at home or even a rear-wheel drive motor and have some experience of this yourself, but even if not, I expect we've all done it in a racing simulator of some sort. So you'll find this exercise very similar to this oversteer drifting. So yes, this is a lot of fun and is all good practice for fine thruster throttle control. And don't worry about hitting anything. If you do, and you will, I certainly did. As long as your shields are active, you'll be fine. See how close you can get, applying primarily forward thrust and a little lateral thrust now and then to either increase your speed or keep the speed consistent. I suggest you experiment with thrust inputs to see how it affects your turn and velocity. Also adding vertical thrusters to keep in line with the station now and then will help with your alignment. Also don't worry about the prongy spike things sticking out that are positioned periodically around the ring. They aren't solid and you can fly right through them. Everything else, however, is solid, so a good gauge of one's success, but like I say, don't worry if you do hit something, it doesn't matter as long as your shields are on. I found this a very useful learning tool when I learned back in early beta because of the speed you are travelling and the consistent thrust inputs required to keep the turn consistent. It's all in the throttle control, all with the space dust to help us simulate the same in open space and benefit us in open space with only the dust. One can do the same exercise but orientated at 90 degrees, so using lateral thrust this time to keep your ship as centralised as possible to the station's ring. Because pitch up is the preferred pitching direction, as discussed throughout most of these lessons, because it's the fastest axis and one can use the canopy to look up and keep an eye on your target. This is a very useful exercise for this. The disadvantage, of course, uh, you can't see where you're actually going because your current vector is below you. But if the station wasn't there, which you combat it obviously wouldn't be, this is a very useful exercise to simulate this real-world application. 
perhaps don't be so bothered about getting very close to the station ring itself. Just try and keep your distance however far away you are and try and keep this distance as consistent as visually possible. All good practice for fine thruster control inputs to see how much of each has an effect on your flight path. You'll barely need to use your joystick for ship orientation, but perhaps add some orientation of varying amounts of pitch, in this case on purpose, to see how it affects your turn and subsequent thruster inputs thereafter. Now we have all the tools and control exercises learned individually and after quite a bit of practice at these exercises and you've got quite good at them, you will hopefully be fairly proficient at piloting in all conditions with flight assist off. Congratulations! You will have made all the necessary control inputs in these individual lessons for us to bring together for successful piloting in open space with just the directions of space dust and the throttle display as our guides. So, the one manoeuvre that you should use primarily in combat over all others and give you an advantage over the battlefield against the FA on pilot. What I've called myself the fundamental redirection manoeuvre, what Isanona and I use regularly. Again, the travelling along the station's axis is the best location for this to see how successful you are at pulling it off by using the station as reference. We'll start travelling forwards down the station's axis as if a hostile were heading directly at us in the opposite direction towards us, which we want to fly over our head. The controls used in this are really simple and are a few inputs, leaving the initial roll to get the target above us aside, because this roll is really before the manoeuvre, so I have plenty of time to input this. So for the actual manoeuvre, all I'm going to use is reverse thrust, then pitch, and then boost with thrust up help. That's it. So, roll initially to line myself up, imagining the hostile is about to fly over my head. Just before the hostile is about to fly past, I'll slow with reverse thrust to around about the blue zone. We'll discuss in more detail where in the blue zone in a minute. But the blue zone anyway because our turn rates are best in this area. But mainly because there are certain benefits the faster or slower we enter this manoeuvre and so can vary our exit speed by varying how high or low in the blue zone that we are positioned in. So, we need to time this slowing of the ship with reverse thrusters, so as we are in the blue zone as the hostile passes over our head. Then immediately, as soon as he has passed over us, we start our initial pitch at full tilt, while simultaneously releasing reverse thrust. Next step is to activate boost to initialize its wind-up, whilst continuing to keep pitch upheld at full tilt. And just before the boost cycle actually kicks in, we add vertical thrust up. Once the boost cycle actually activates, you'll notice the ship suddenly increasing its pitch rate, so we must be holding thrust up before this boost actually kicks in. Then, to finish off, we are anticipating when to release everything and counter pitch up with pitch down to head off back the way we came to follow and tail the hostile. So, to reiterate, all I'm using is roll initially, nothing special, then reverse thrust to slow us into the blue zone. Pitch up at full tilt and keep holding it. Activate boost mid-ish pitch. Just before the boost cycle actually activates, I add thrust up, so the boost is primarily sent through the bottom of the ship, so we are shot towards the target back the way we came. And to finish off, a slight pitch down counter to stop the ship pitching. The inputs themselves are very simple in this manoeuvre. The secret to its success is all about timing. But hopefully the lessons we've learnt will benefit us to achieve this more easily once you have practised all the previous lessons. Then, this is all a timing issue. So, concerning the variations in the blue zone area. Ultimately, the best area to set your speed before you initiate this manoeuvre depends on the speed differential between you and the target travelling towards you. We'd obviously like to latch onto the hostile after making this manoeuvre and be as close as possible on his tail. So this is where slowing or speeding up to specific areas of the blue zone, perhaps higher sometimes, will enable us to vary our exit speed by wasting less or more of the boost cycle by using our current momentum. Again, much of getting this down successfully will depend on the ship you are flying and the ship you are fighting, but a good rule of thumb is 
The faster your approach speeds combined towards each other means you will want to use all or most of your entire boost set. However, in the instances when the difference in combined approach speeds are quite small, you'll actually want to waste some of the boost cycle so as not to overshoot your target. So when these approach speeds combined between you and your hostile is low or slow, the faster you should enter the maneuver, in turn stopping you from overshooting the target because you have wasted some of the boost cycle by entering the maneuver faster and used your current higher momentum to waste some of the boost. So, the higher your combined approach speeds, the lower part of blue zone, and so the slower your combined approach speeds, the higher part of blue zone. A good rule of thumb so as to latch onto a hostile and be as close behind him as possible. Obviously this doesn't work all the time, there are certain further variations in this whole manoeuvre. We are assuming, in this just demonstrated, the target has gone whizzing by us and continued on his vector straight ahead, which obviously doesn't necessarily happen. We will cover this in more detail with more techniques in part 3, for instance using your display HUD of your target ship to check its orientation and then anticipate that he will probably be pitching up as well as soon as you pass each other. So knowing this by looking closely at your target HUD of his ship's orientation will benefit us to boost off in the right direction. There we go guys, I hope that wasn't too dreary and that you perhaps enjoyed practicing some of the lessons. Uh, thanks for your time, I appreciate time is money so I've tried to make the lessons as exciting as possible and using what we have in the game at our disposal. Mainly to try and get the most benefit so as to learn piloting with no assist as quickly as possible. It might feel a little tedious initially before you start seeing improvements, but really stick with them. You will not regret learning these fundamental basic techniques for a successful flight assist off basic skill set. There will be a further supplementary guide part 3, once I've had time to make it, to go into more detail about when I think the best times are to actually toggle between flight assist on and off. The toggle timings in these exercises obviously aren't necessarily the time you would be switching. The point of adding them was so you can learn what inputs you need to apply depending on your varying ship orientations. So you'll be better equipped to decide when yourself because you've learned what to do at each toggle transition. Also in part 3 I'll be explaining other manoeuvres and techniques in more detail I find useful. This was supposed to be the toggle guide primarily, but thought it best to introduce the toggling technique with these exercises you've just watched before we start applying them in combat. So part 3 will be on the cards in the coming week or so, but in the meantime, get used to practicing all these exercises, and if you can start to pull off each effectively individually, then you'll be much better equipped for all conditions in combat with most ship maneuvers as a whole with flight assist off, and be able to bring them all together in whole complete maneuvers, and then we'll start to use toggling between the two modes in combat. Thanks again for watching, and please don't forget to thumbs up, thumbs down, comment your woes, even subscribe if you like what you've been watching. Again, I really appreciate all the comments I've had so far on my previous uploads. Uh, without you subscribers, my channel wouldn't have much point to it, so thanks, and let me know how you get on. The primary reason for making these guides is I'm hoping you'll be able to increase your enjoyment and join in on the fun I'm having personally. And this Nona, he's clearly having fun, so a lot of thanks should go to the man himself as well. I've learnt an incredible amount from watching him, but hopefully this guide, with breaking things down into individual manageable lessons, will help you to understand it's not quite as hard as you're probably thinking it is. It's simply a different way of piloting. Good luck and fly reckless, man. Sorry, safe. Safe.